as who might own it in an unknown future. Dana Boyd is a sociologist at Harvard University who believes there are lessons from history in how data collected today can have unintended consequences tomorrow. There's been times in history where we've collected mass amounts of data without even thinking about how it would get used in the future, often for really good intentions. A good example of that is in the early 1900s, the Netherlands started collecting all sorts of information about its citizens for the best of intentions. One of the bits of data they collected during that period was people's religion in order to give people a proper burial. They had no idea that in 1939, uh, when the Nazis invaded the Netherlands, that that data would be used for what, how it was used. We have companies collecting massive amounts of data about citizens. People don't have an imagination of what it means to aggregate all of that data going forward. They have these expectations of what possible terrible things can be done with these huge digital dossiers. Frankly, most companies aren't quite sure what to do with them yet. The companies are still trying to work it out, which is why they're collecting all of this data. And they're not quite sure where it's going. But perhaps just as troubling as these huge automated databases are the databases we freely add intimate information to ourselves. The great wave of web innovation since Google has been in social media, networking through video, microblogs, and sites like Facebook and MySpace. Young people have pioneered this revolution, and Dana Boyd is studying how they feel about living in an online commercial space. There's so much data being collected about us online. Do you think that kids are complicit with this? Do you think that they know what's going on? Or do you think that they're naive about what's going to happen with their data trail? The irony is that young people actually understand the corporation advertising trade-off better than they understand the long-term implications of that data uh, and information. So one of the things you'll hear from young people is they'll say, well, if it gives me ads, you know, that means it'll be free. And, you know, I'd rather it be free. And part of it is they've never known a non-commercial world. Advertising is pervasive in their lives. The generation growing up with the web may be embracing commercial reality in return for free convenience. But aren't they missing out on what the old web once promised? What we've done is limited the range of human expression and activity on the internet to those things that are market friendly. Look at the devolution of people's personal presence online from the quirky, individualistic, highly personalized websites, the home pages of the HTML mid-90s, to the now utterly conformist and rigid profiles on something like MySpace and Facebook, you can no longer define yourself by anything, you must define yourself by what books you buy, by what movies you like, by what actresses you aspire to, by whether you are single, married, or looking. You know, by things that the market understands. But the problems facing the younger generation run deeper still. I'm concerned that there's little understanding of one of the fundamentals of digital information. Once it's on the web, it's almost impossible to erase. All of our interactions on the web, from our Facebook and Twitter status updates, to news that we share with family and friends, to gossip that spread about us, will be online forever. The web effectively makes us immortal. The upside is that we can live on. There are thousands of dead people who are still receiving updates and even being poked on Facebook. But the downside is that young people who are growing up in public by living so much of their lives on the web will have to face living with all of their youthful indiscretions that can now be accessed by anyone. Future bosses, future partners, future friends. And that's for the rest of their lives. The fact that you are just a regular person does not entitle you to any guarantee that pictures of you drunk and passed out are not going to be spread across the internet. And so in a sense, we all have to live like celebrities because there's that potential that we'll be treated like them. One of the biggest threats comes from consumers themselves. 
young people in particular who are having no doubt wonderful fun on social networking sites, meeting lots of people but forgetting the permanency of that kind of engagement. If people consider companies holding their DNA fingerprint, they somehow get a lot more emotionally uh, disturbed by the thought that decisions might be taken about insurance, healthcare provision, lifestyle, on the basis of that genetic fingerprint. The digital fingerprint is every bit as valuable. Do you really want these intimate details about yourself to be available to so many people? And will you feel the same way about what you did last night, not just in the morning, but 40 years later? We have seen how we are all trading a little bit of our privacy each time we search and network online. In return for a free web, our privacy has become a commodity. We are economic units in what has become the new commercial frontier. We've entered this deal in many cases unwittingly, perhaps because a deal just isn't the experience that we think we're having on the web. On a computer at home or commuting with our mobile while traveling, we feel we're in a closed, private bubble. But the reality of the web's open networks is that we are, in effect, always public. What we do on our computers has the potential to be seen, analyzed, and used by others all around the world. The web disrupts our sense of public and private space. We're not just transacting with one computer, we're actually having a conversation with a multitude of computers across the globe, and we're being watched. That is what makes this such a revolution, and the dawn of a new era. Some genies, when they're let out of a bottle, can, you know, can cause problems, and they certainly can't ever go back in the bottle. When cars first arose, people were horrified at the deaths on the road. Horrified, they couldn't believe it. I mean, there were, there were hundreds of people being, being squelched every day. It was grotesque, and, and you know, if you just braked in a car at 30 miles an hour, you'd kill yourself on the steering wheel, you'd break your neck. People were dying all the time. Did they say, oh, well, well, that's it then. Oh, we can't have cars, sorry. In the same way as if someone says, actually, these mobile phones do give out microwaves, and they will give you brain cancer. Are we going to say, oh, well, that's the end of that technology then? Not on your nelly. There's a risk-reward ratio here. And for us, the reward is so great that whatever the risk is, we try and contain it and understand it. I don't like this extremist view that the web is suddenly a danger zone where unpleasant people can more easily find their vulnerable targets. You know, that's the extremities, as it always has been in every society. And as long as you educate to make people safe, I think the bulk of what happens in the web is interesting, exciting, supportive, fun, entertaining, and magic. Paradoxically, what makes us exposed as never before is also what makes the web such a magical opportunity to share roam and nose around in the riches of human knowledge. But as commerce comes to dominate the web, I believe we must wake up and understand the true cost of free, how it's redefining privacy, personal space, and perhaps ultimately, who we are. How do you feel about your privacy online? Join the debate at bbc.co.uk forward slash virtual revolution. And follow the links to the Open University for more from those reshaping the web and the world. Next time, the impact of the web on how we think and how we relate. How our kids are becoming, for better or for worse, the Facebook generation. And the virtual revolution returns an hour earlier next Saturday at 8.15. But next tonight, Stephen Fry's on again with Bill Bailey and Barry Humphreys joining the Bantamisters for QI.